Hello and welcome to the Global Travel Channel podcast show. I'm your host, Mark Philpot, and today I have another great guest lined up. I'm doing a series of podcasts this week on travel blogging and I'm speaking with a handful of travel bloggers who have changed their lives and decided to chase the freedom of global travel and to make a living from doing it. Today it's a very warm welcome to the Global Travel Channel podcast show to Lee Scrivener. Lee, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much. Good morning. How are you doing? Yeah, no no complaints here. You were just telling me that you've uh, just been off for a swim this morning. Yeah tough life um, we're in Kuala Lumpur at the moment and I've got this infinity pool that looks out over the city so it'd be rude not to go for a swim you know <laughs> it would be very rude yes Kuala Lumpur a great part of the world we'll talk about that um, as we go through the show today but have you ever been on a podcast before um, oh in my previous life working in corporate yes but not actually as a as a full-time travel or backpacker so uh, yeah you're popping my cherry actually Mark there you go. Well, fantastic that I get that opportunity. So thank you for giving it to me. And um, I'll be as gentle on you as I possibly can. Oh. So no no guarantees on anything, in other words, uh, as far as that goes. Look, I'm doing a series at the moment this week in particular on travel bloggers and people that have decided to change their lives and to go out there in the world and chase that sense of freedom. So you're one of a handful of people that I am having a chat to. So it's really interesting to get everybody's different story on this. But before we go into Travelscribes.com, which is your platform, I just want to let you know that um, we share at least one thing in common, and that's bo we've both worked for the world's largest yellow branded company, yeah? Yes. DHL. So how long did you work for DHL for? Oh, goodness. Um, I think uh, just under nine years, Mark, and uh, started off in Cape Town working in their Africa department, and they moved me to Germany to work in the global head office. I'm sure you'll agree, it really is one of the best companies to work for in the world, and I say that as an ex-employee, so that means something. Mm. No, it absolutely is, and, and you've just mentioned Cape Town, and I've got fond memories of laying on the beach at Clifton and well, I won't go into all the details of the troubles I got up to in Cape Town, but it is a fantastic part of the world. Um, do you miss it? Do you miss Cape Town? Um, I mean, as with anything, if you're, if you're away from home, right, I think you miss your friends and your family. To be honest, I don't miss Cape Town as much as you might think, um, mm. mainly just because I think that there are so many other beautiful places in the world, and I've, s I've been lucky enough to see so many of them, right? So if I could transport my friends and my family somewhere else, I think I'd be okay. Yeah, sure. What did you do when you worked at DHL? What was your job role? Uh, marketing, digital marketing, actually, which was always quite interesting and, and probably helped me a lot with the blog that we'll, we'll talk about later. But I'm not actually from a digital or marketing background. Um, you know, I'm more writer and kind of public relations. But, you know, they gave me a great opportunity when I was working there over the years. And so, yeah, I, I looked after kind of search engine optimization and social media and all of those newfangled things that I didn't know much about. So you must have been based in Bonn, were you? Yeah, in and before you asked me, I loved living in Bonn. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, um, hmm. for anyone who worked at DHL, there was always a stigma about working in, in Bonn, which was the global head office of the company, because it's quite a small city in Germany. But I loved it. Mm. Uh, it's a great mm. expat community in that town. Um, you right on the river, go for runs, hiking in the forest. I think the German way of life is actually quite a good one. Mm. No, you're right. The ones that weren't in the glass tower had a certain perspective about yeah. it, that's for sure. <laughs> now, DHL, a great company that enables you to travel the world. Did you get to do a lot of global travel as a oh, corporate Oh, you have no idea. I mean, I think in my first two years, I visited 40 countries um, with DHL. Mm. Um, but of course, it's a very different type of travel. Um, you know, one is obviously it affords you five-star luxury right you're traveling business class you're staying at the Hilton you've got a private driver picking you up things that I would love right now if I'm honest um, <laughs> but you also didn't get to see too much right you know it was usually as with any corporate travel you're in the airplane you're in the airport you're in the hotel and you're in the office and you know I think whenever you went to these countries the local teams would do a great job of trying to take you out and see the city but really you're there to work right so um, I saw mm, a lot of mm. the world, but I also saw a lot of the inside of a Hilton. What was the inspiration behind 
leaving that corporate oh. life and, and starting your own travel Yeah, platform. I think it was really difficult, right? Because I think most people who are trying to get into what I'm kind of doing at the moment are because they're burnt out or they're angry or, you know, they've got a lot of, you know, negativity in their life. Whereas for me, I actually was, had a pretty good life. Um, so mm. I think the inspiration was probably different to others in that, you know, I'd been in Germany for six years with my husband. We loved it, but it wasn't a forever home. Um, and we started looking at different options and we realized, you know, we're in our mid thirties. We have both had great paying jobs for a while that has afforded us, you know, a good savings nest egg. Um, and we don't have any kids, right? So it's kind of a perfect opportunity to say, well, let's take some time out. Let's see if we could travel for a bit and do some of the things that we wanted to do while we have that kind of flexibility. So like I said, it wasn't really something where I thought, oh, you know, I'm, I'm done, I'm fed up, which is where a lot of people get to where they make that kind of decision. I did it from, you know, a place of joy and a place of love, which I think has meant that I really still have great relationships with everyone that I used to work with. And I might just go back into corporate. Mm. You just don't know. Yeah, you never know what's going to come up yeah. in the future, that's for sure. How was the transition process for you when you decided to make that decision? Was there let's say, a lot of time in that planning before you actually did make the transition or did it happen quite quickly for it you? Happened, it, took, it took a few months, actually, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, of course, if you're in a corporate job, you have quite a long notice period. So that was one I had to work out. Um, obviously, we, we sold everything that we owned except for our cat and our wedding gifts, right? So <laughs> that <laughs> took some time because we had a... Never get rid never of the cat. Never get rid of the cat. Of the cat. <laughs> but, you know, we had a lot of stuff um, that needed to be sold um, b before we kind of moved on. So there was all of those good things. Um, but also we had a bit of a curveball in that we were meant to kind of kick off in, in April of this year and go to India. Um, but then my husband was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. Um, so we had to delay our trip, um, firstly for him to get specialist care, um, but also for us to see if we actually could travel because many people who have his disease aren't able to travel. Um, so I think, yeah. um, you know, like I say, we intended to leave within kind of four to five months. And I think it took us longer, for like six to seven in the end. So did that add an enormous amount of pressure to your decision process to find out that your husband had been unfortunately diagnosed with this yeah, disease? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the pressure firstly was financial. Um, you know, mm. we had booked a lot of things because we we're both planners. So we would planned a hell of a lot and we booked accommodation <laughs> and flights and transport for a long time. So, you know, would our travel insurance pay out? And, and thank goodness they did. So there was that financial mm. pressure. And I think also when you make such a big decision to leave your workplace after so many years and everybody that you love, there's also that pressure to make good on what you said you would do. And you feel that kind of pressure that, oh, I said I was going to do it, so I must. Um, and, mm. you know, I think it would we would have felt like failures if we couldn't have gone. Um, and we had just moved to London for a few months um, at, at the time. And, of course, the the healthcare in the UK is a lot different to in Germany, so that was also quite challenging for us, not really understanding how we would go about getting him the care that he needed and whether we could go. Mm. Really fascinating some of the things you said there in particular because I have a lot of people listening to the show today who are in that perhaps transition yeah. period. And one of the things that I get in chatting with people about quite a lot is that whole peer pressure oh, situation, yeah. particularly when you're going from corporate into something that's way outside of a lot of people's comfort zone. So it's interesting that you felt as though that there was an expectation that one had oh, to yeah. live up to. Is, is that kind of what you were saying? Absolutely. Around that? And, you know, everyone's kind mm. of also living vicariously through you is another part. Um, you know, all yeah. of our friends are married with kids um, and they all thought this was such a great idea for us to do. So it's almost like we're disappointing them. Um, and even now we feel a lot of pressure, if I'm honest, um, particularly through social platforms like Instagram, which, um, you know, we do a lot of kind of posting and stories, etc. on Instagram. We've grown our following there, but there's a lot of pressure to have a perfect travel life, to stay in beautiful places, to always be on, if you know what I mean. So, mm. yeah, even mm. now that mm. we are free, um, we're still you know, find ourselves under some sort of pressure wherever that might come from. So given that you've done that and you've made that separation, what would you say to someone that's out there listening to this podcast today who's sitting in their cubicle in their glass tower 
who's wanting to, to chase their dream, what would your piece of advice be to them for that early stage of actually going oh, and doing that's it? that's so difficult because, you know, there's actually also nothing wrong with sitting in a glass tower in a cubicle. Um, and mm. I think also sometimes that, you know, I, I love the decision that we've made, but, you know, perhaps you might think of it as a form of escapism to go and travel and, and, and to start your own blog, but also perhaps you're just looking for a different role at a different company, right? So I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd have any advice to somebody other than go and do it, which sounds really twee. Um, and mm. I think it's really different for everybody. I think you also have to look at where, you know, where that need is coming from. Um, and whether mm. you're just looking for something because the grass is greener or whether you truly want to do something or it's just a form of escapism, I'm not sure. I think you've hit the nail on the head, though, because I think in case of if you do just go and do it, you find out either way, yeah. don't you? You find out whether it was the right thing for you or whether you need to go back and do something similar yeah. to what you were doing before. I mean, one of the things I would mm. say to anybody is what I wish I had done, Mark, is actually looked at what I was doing. And I don't mean the travel side, but I mean the blogging side as a bit of a side hustle to what I was doing. I wish I had yeah. started it earlier um, and not just seen it as it's either this or that. Um, mainly yeah. because, uh, and a very good friend mentioned this to me the other day, and I thought it was quite profound. You know, a side hustle allows you to really evaluate which kind of work or what you're passionate about and, you know, what kind of brings in the right amount of income versus how much work you need to do, right? If you only have one mm. stream of income, you know, you're very beholden to that income. So if you're retrenched or, or something happens, of course, there's a problem there. But also you don't really know what brings you joy and what really you enjoy. Um, and so, like I say, I, I really would probably, if you wanting to do something like blogging, etc., you know, you're in worst enemy, just get started and do it as a side hustle because then you can decide whether it's something that you want to take full time. I think that's great advice. And, and yesterday I had an Irishman on the show who did exactly or who's doing exactly that so he's in the in the journalism industry in mm -hmm. Canada and his side hustle is doing his travel blog and getting out when he can to do it but he's finding through that process that it is yeah. his passion and then he wants to do it full time but he's he's taking baby steps to get there he's not making that black and white decision of I've got to go tomorrow and yeah. do it full time and you don't need to do it full time and there's loads of people in the blogging mm. communities that we're in that you know are doing it alongside having a baby or having a full-time job or having a part-time job whatever that might be um but yeah, yeah that you know as with anything in life you, you know you could have out of 10 things that you start nine of them might fail right so why not do it with no risk yeah and i also like the point that you raised about when you put all your eggs in one basket and you've got all this external pressure as you're finding now on social media there's no other release because it's all you've got to yeah. focus on. And, and I'm not I'm not trying to be judgmental on that. I'm just saying in the basis that you put all your heart and soul into that one purpose and yet people still want more. The appetite's Basically. out there, obviously. So it's just one of those one of those things, yeah. isn't it? Now, travelscribes.com is what we're going to be talking about today. So where, when, and how did this whole travel crusade actually start? Can you remember the actual day you sat down and said, right, we're going to start travelscribes.com? Um, I can't remember the day that we decided to start Travel Scribe. I can remember the day that we decided to do this entire, you know, give up the nine to five travel. And then, you know, later the idea of the blog came to fruition was um, we were sitting on a beach in Croatia and we were discussing all of this, you know, what, what should we do with our lives? Um, and, mm. you know, looking out over the sea and just seeing the boats bobbing up and down and just thought, oh, there's got to be a different life to what we're doing right now. Right. So that was our original there is. Mm. original decision. <laughs> and there were, I don't think there was one particular day when we decided, oh, we should start a travel blog. But I do remember that it was a passion project. So for us, it was never a side hustle or form of income, something formal. Right. It was yeah. okay, well, we should probably document this. We've got an Instagram profile. Maybe we should start a blog, right? So mm -hmm. we started, um, you know, putting together that blog. I think end of last year was, you know, we're playing around with getting a theme and getting a WordPress site and all that kind of stuff, right? And we yep. launched it, I think, in around May time. And like I say, it was really just a personal passion project documenting our travels. And our goal was to get 10,000 uh, kind of users a month by the end of this year. And suddenly mm. within our fourth month, we had 110,000, right? 
And wow. we were just like, wow. oh, I see. Um, you know, what we really, like I said, was almost like a personal diary is attracting loads of people. And there's an opportunity yep. for us here to, to make some money and to potentially make a living off it. So like I say, it was never something mm. which was, you know, as you said earlier, black and white. It was just a decision that kind of just, we, we rolled with it over time and it's almost snowballed into what we're doing now. Yeah, fantastic. That's a great story to hear how that yeah. got going. Now, you call yourselves moderate meanders. Explain that one for oh, us all. I don't know. I think it's because we don't like to be put in any kind of spectrum. So, you know, on one side you have backpackers, which we kind of are because we have backpacks, right? Um, mm. uh, but backpackers stay in hostels and, you know, backpackers are only eating $1 dinners, right? Um, and we're not that. Mm. But we're also not you know, lux luxury travelers. We're not staying at five-star hotels. You know, we're not eating at fine dining establishments. So we're kind of somewhere in between. I also think when it comes to speed of travel, you know, you have people that spend one or two days in a city and then move on. And then you pe have people who spend weeks or a month in a city. Again, we're kind of somewhere in between. It might have something to do with our age, but, you know, we don't have that exuberant 20s youthfulness, mm. but, you know, we do still have mm. energy. So... I think there's a lot of people who, like I say, it's somewhere in the middle, right? You're staying at maybe a three-star. Sometimes you're staying at a nice villa. Sometimes it's a bit more grubby, you know, as I said. Yeah, sometimes you're going quickly. Sometimes you're, you're somewhere in the middle. So, yeah, we're just smack bang in the middle of everything. Has that positioning helped you connect with a certain audience? Is, is it the demographics being pulled in, do you think? because of that fact that you've chosen to be in that middle? You know, I would hope so, but to be honest, it's not scientific and probably we were just lucky that we've engaged with an audience. <laughs> there was no plan. I wish I could say I had some sort of master plan um, for, mm. for, for that to work. And, and again, in terms of our demographics, we actually find quite a much younger audience uh, that tend to read our site and follow our Instagram um, than we ourselves. Actually, we're probably at the top end of the spectrum in terms of the demographics. So mm. I, as a, with anything, for us, it's just been luck. Right. Well, that's really interesting to hear because in, in the last couple of um, shows I've done with your respective colleagues yeah. in the travel blogging industry, I've... I've really honed in on the social media thing to find out how much of an important step it is and how much time they spend on creating this community. Yeah. You've got over 20,000 followers now on Instagram. How how have you nurtured that in terms of, have you just seen an explosion straight out and it's kind of plateaued off or is the trajectory still going through the oh, roof? Oh, it's definitely plateaued. I mean, um, we have entirely fallen out of love, to be honest, with Instagram as a platform. Um, it was something that we really enjoyed doing maybe a year ago. Um, and we were seeing massive increases in the number of followers that we had in the engagement. Um, with the changes in the right. algorithm of Instagram, we've really, like, like you said, it's really kind of tapered off. Um, and actually, we, you know, Instagram doesn't drive a lot of traffic to anybody's blog, right? Any blogger will tell you that Instagram is not their main source of traffic. It would be kind of uh, Google search. It would maybe be Pinterest. So it's a bit of a yep. vanity platform, if I must say. Um, that said, mm. on our on our travel blog, we do also create content um, around Instagram itself. So it would be, you know, it, it would be, a, you know, for me to actually have all of this Instagram content on our website and not use Instagram myself. I'm, I'm not sure that that would be, you know, very good thing. That would probably be quite hypocritical. So that's why we've, you yeah. know, we continue to use the platform. But yeah, I, like I say, I've fallen a little bit out of love with it. So when you started, you were you were gun ho about all the different social media platforms. Did you have an expectation that one was going to perform better than another one from from any research or knowledge that you had? Yeah, in that space? I think I always had this view that Pinterest um, was going to be a huge referrer of traffic, um, and I know that for travel, um, particularly, which is our niche that we operate in, Pinterest is a is a great platform to be able to drive that traffic. Um, Again, mm. as I said, you know, for us, 95% of the traffic to our website is through Google search. So that's something that we now take very seriously. And I wish we had taken more seriously when we started the blog. Um, you know, mm. doing search engine optimization, understanding Google search is the critical factor for any blog. Um, and I right. said, you know, if you are going to start one, you have to start with SEO at the core, right? Like I say, we've been really yep. lucky. Yep. 
But, you know, now that we've learned and perfected what we're doing, I wish we had started that earlier. Now, for the listeners out there that are not familiar with some of the terms yes. that you're using, we're, we're, we're talking about hashtags, keywords, all these sorts of things that you're putting within your content. That's Is that right. right. So, um, like I say, the, the main driver for, for any website nowadays is making sure that you rank highly in Google. Um, and that would be search engine optimization. So making sure that the content that you create has all the right keywords that people are looking for so that, like I say, if you're making your way up the page of Google, everybody wants to click on the number one result, right? So that's your prime position. So like I say, our mm. focus is ensuring that the blog posts and articles that we write are kind of sprinkled, if you, may, if you may, with the right keywords, that the images we used are correctly named, all these really basic things, right? Um, but making sure yeah. every piece of content that we create is totally optimized for Google to say, this piece of content is really relevant to what somebody is searching for and should come up in the number mm. one position. So what would your top tips be for anybody out there that's wanting to grow their, their audience on social media today? If you were to give them three hot tips, what would you tell them to focus with on? anything you know don't don't chase fame don't chase keywords all these types of things i know it's, again it sounds a little bit twee but write for your readers and write about what you know and what you love and sprinkle that with like i say seo and technical knowledge right because you're going to have a lot of brands out there or, or other bloggers or people who are going to just you know chase a number one position or chase followers etc on instagram but that is going to be fleeting right like i say instagram it's the thing right now is it the thing in 10 years you know d don't focus on the platform mm. yeah. yeah that's really good advice as well do you find that the travel blogging landscape is extremely competitive or do you see it as a very independent niche for everybody that's doing their own that thing? This something, honestly, this particular topic comes up a lot in all of our communities because every few years, um, everyone will say, mm. oh, there's no space for my travel blog. And when we started ours, we thought, oh, there's no space for our travel blog. But it is amazing how much space is still out there if you have, one, good content, uh, two, optimize that content, but three, also just chosen something that you love, right? So... You know, if if you are based in Romania, right, why not write very intricate guides to different cities in Romania? Because there are loads of people looking to go to Romania who want that, you know, great content. And maybe they don't want to go to a culture trip or a trip savvy or a lonely planet, which everybody gets the same kind of recommendations. So, yeah, it's competitive, yeah, but right. everyone's like I say, everyone's part of one community. And there's there seems to always be space. I don't know why. I don't know how it happens, but there's always space mm. for another travel blog. Well, I think it's the fact that the travel industry yeah. is just so huge and there, there are so many different, and, and, and you've only got to look every year how the dynamics within the industry, the hotspots that are, that, get, that are coming up in the world, that it's a shifting momentum mm. all the time within the industry, the way that we travel. Um, you know, we're talking here in Australia today where the world's longest aircraft yeah. flight just landed this morning in Sydney from New York, a direct flight, 19 and a half hours. That's going to change the aviation landscape. It's going to change yeah. the travel landscape in the next few years to come. It's always shifting, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, although that does that sort of bring up, goes. you know, one of my pet peeves and something that I really don't know how to deal with, which is this idea of over tourism, right? Because as I do travel around, mm. this democratization mm. of travel does create major issues in a lot of countries and cities and, and sites. Um, so, you know, on one hand, I'm really, I'm really happy to the, the opportunity that travel affords me, right? But on the other hand, it, it can be quite saddening to kind of go around and, and see how this you know how this is turning certain cities around yeah that's a fascinating point because i was talking also yesterday with another travel blogger and yeah. we were talking about conscious travel and how how conscious are we when we actually travel from the time that we book that airplane flight and understanding oh. the environmental impact of that right through to our um, yeah. Go happy, snap happy camera yeah. um, tours of every country, making sure that we get a oh, smiley yeah. Cambodian child in our photograph and put it on a selfie. So I, I'm really pleased you brought that up because it's a hot topic for me. It's something that a yeah. lot of people listening to the show yeah. are concerned about. But I also use the flip side and I want to play devil's advocate for a second if I may. 
And I would say, well, travel brings so many benefits in terms mm-hmm. of bringing us together as a global community, but also creating that respect between cultures. And if we weren't to do that, would we have a world that's more angry and more naive you know, about possibly. each other? Possibly. I think, like I said, it's such a multifaceted issue, right? Because, like I say, you could also mm. say to me, Lee, well, you know, travel brings investment into countries that need it, right? Uh, but, you know, does that mm. investment go to the people that need it? Usually not in my experience so far. Um, so, uh, you know, it's 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 such a big issue that I don't even know how to tackle it other than to say that this topic keeps me up at night. And, you know, I'm not really sure mm. how it's going to be solved in a way that everybody's going to be happy. So is this crusade that you're on doing what you're doing at the moment, opening your eyes to some things that you hadn't previously yeah, considered about Yeah, I mean, like I say, I, I really had um, no idea in terms of, you know, what I saw on social media versus what the reality of things were, right? So um, that's that's been mm. really eye-opening. Of course, um, also the the uglier side of of some of these things around corruption etc has definitely been brought to the top of my mind but if i look at the positives i've also seen how this this trip and and traveling full-time has opened me up to so many not just job opportunities but opportunities for entrepreneurship right not only supporting locals right you know a local guy who's a driver who has no idea how a website would be able to improve his business or just a business card right or just opening you know a little instagram profile for himself where he can promote his travels um so so that's really rewarding being able to support small local drivers and businesses in improving what they're doing but even for me to see the other opportunities i mean i'm just buzzing every day with the kinds of businesses that i could open um that are related to travel Mm. Mm. that that's fascinating because it then brings us into that whole realm of what we what impact we can Mm. actually do when we travel and if we look at if we look at the world in the way that you have just described in terms of using our yeah professional skills for those that have been fortunate enough to have that pathway um you can really make a difference yeah. to somebody in some of the ways that you've just mentioned i really really love that yeah now getting on to your travels how do you choose your next destination you know, where you're going to go as I said, to? we were real planners right so everything was planned and and we had everything you know we had our, our travels planned all the way up until january next year um, but as time has gone on, we've become more flexible. So we chose a lot of places, particularly in Southeast Asia, to start, um, as well as China, which we were very, very passionate about. But we chose all of those because of the cost of travel. You know, yes, we are on a mm. budget. Um, that said, I, you know, I don't really think I'm the kind of person who's going to be able to go to, say, Japan and stay in a tiny little hostel. I just, I, I can't do it, right? So it would be much easier for me to go to mm. Cambodia or Laos and stay in a villa at the same price. So for us, we've chosen things a lot right. based on budget. Um, but, you know, over time, we've started to become more flexible. So right now, I'm in Kuala Lumpur, but I w- we were supposed to be in Cebu in the Philippines. Um, but we decided mm. when looking into it that, to be honest, you know, the price of accommodation in Cebu for us uh, was just not worth going there where we could come to Kuala Lumpur and uh, we could, you know, stay in a really beautiful Airbnb overlooking the city. So we made a bit of a decision there. Um, I also think that you find your travel style when you travel longer term, you know, so. For us, we're Mm. pretty exhausted after five and a half months of full-time travel where we're moving every three days. So, you know, we had to change our style Mm. to now go, okay, let's spend two weeks in an apartment cooking our own food. Oh, what! how beautiful. So nice to cook our own food. (laughs) Let's cook our own food for two weeks. Let's go to the gym every morning. Let's get into a routine. You really do change honestly every few weeks and and your outlook in terms of where you want to go and what you want to do and whether you actually want to go and see all the sites in one city or you just want to lie by the pool right you know that changes really every few weeks for us depending on how we're feeling now before we talk about (laughs) putting the mealies on the braai let's talk about um traveling traveling Mm. as a young couple as you've just explained has there been any times when you've sort of thought come on we've got to put our roots down somewhere and and have a base camp or is it is just just a 
in the spur of the moment, we're going to do this for as long as it um, feels right to know, do for you two? Really, it's really challenging since, you know, for us, the idea is always to go back to London, um, to put down roots, to buy oh. a house, um, to have a family, all these types of things. But, you know, as you as we're moving around and we're seeing all these different countries, you know, we'll go to Hanoi and go, oh, the quality of life in Hanoi and, and you know, how, how the food and the culture and everything, we should live here, right? Or going to Shanghai and seeing mm. how incredibly modern the city is and, you know, seeing the opportunities that you have there. Wow, wouldn't Shanghai be a fantastic place to base ourselves long term? But, you know, that said, I do think that, mm. You know, yet we're in our mid to late thirties. We, like I say, we do want to have a family. You know, probably we are going to go back soon and settle in London. James is going to go back to his previous job. You know, we're going to, you know, put down some roots there because it's at a time of our lives where we do need a bit of stability. Mm. And and I'm sure that with James's medical condition, that's also yes, a major absolutely. factor in this he whole process. He has a condition called ulcerative colitis, which um, it actually is a Western disease, uh, put that in parentheses, because essentially um, it's n in the developing world, they don't actually have this disease. So that means that in terms of healthcare in Southeast Asia, where we're mainly traveling, you don't have the medical facilities. Um, and generally, if we do want to get medical assistance for him, we'd have to fly to Australia. And so I think that's definitely a huge thing mm. to consider for anybody who is traveling with an illness is what kind of medical support you can get and where you would travel. It's why we didn't go to India, even though we would love to. You know, it's just not safe for him to travel there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, understandably so. Now, making a living from being a travel blogger, when you had this explosion on your Instagram page, did you think about all the money rolling in and all the opportunities from that? What, I mean, what was the reality of that Luckily, because I come from the other side of the fence, Mark, and that I was in marketing for corporates, I know that we were not big enough to truly make the kind of cash that I would love to, um, and that would replace a previous mm. high-paying corporate salary. So I definitely was... Um, I, I knew exactly what I was getting myself into and I, I know how, how much we could potentially earn, which was never to replace what we had before. Um, that said, as I said, you know, yeah. for us in terms of our blog, it's now the website itself, we monetizing that through advertising and affiliate marketing. We definitely can now see a path yep. towards um, replacing a full-time salary or like I say, actually going kind of independent of uh, from from corporate life. Um, but yeah, that really, that really is something where we are meeting exactly the expectations we thought we had in terms of 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 cash. Okay, mm. so you talk about affiliate marketing. A lot of people listening would be saying, "Well, there's a lot of skepticism oh, yeah. around affiliate marketing, and you know, there's a lot of controls." H how have you actually found it in reality, and and is yeah, it worthwhile well as far as again, you're concerned? Yeah, I think affiliate marketing is one of those things where I think you have to be very careful, right? So yes, as a as a blogger, mm. if I am putting a link to a hotel group or something where I'm going to earn commission, firstly, I need to make sure that my reader. Um, does not suffer from that or has a, a higher price, right? So that's the first thing that I think about is making sure that I'm, I will only make commission or money off something where that doesn't de have detriment to the other person. Um, the other thing which, which right. really kind of is, uh, grates me sometimes is in terms of the kinds of affiliates that people choose. You know, a lot of bloggers, as an example, promote this global insurance company, which I won't mention the name of. And I know that they do it because mm. they get a lot of money from that particular commission. But I also know that that is a terrible insurer um, where if you actually do have a medical problem, you're going to run into major problems. We would never, ever promote right. that affiliate, right? Similar to we, we had a, mm. a transport affiliate for Southeast Asia, which we were promoting on our site. And we actually used them ourselves um, when we were in Indonesia and they were absolutely terrible when it came to customer service. So we removed uh -huh. them, right? Because it uh -huh. has to be authentic. And I, you yep. know, I just think that we can't promote um, companies that are not actually, don't have great customer service, right? So, so let's talk about the emotional side of that attachment because I'm sure as a, as a couple that are starting off and, and also for the listeners here that are listening about wanting to start a travel blog, there must be an emotional adrenaline that comes along with somebody actually, you know, saying yes to an affiliate program and having you on board and all the rest of it. 
it must be hard to say no to some brands in terms of particularly when you're just starting off or were you pretty much steadfast we very steadfast if i'm honest um mainly since again we've mm. uh one of the best ways that we've learned how to like say monetize our website and increase our traffic is being in these different blogging communities and different facebook groups that provide you support and a lot of these, mm. there are a number of different horror stories in there in terms of affiliate programs that they signed up to, or um, as an example, a, a brand approaching them to write a, a blog post on their website um, where that you know there's been major issues with that brand later on. Um, so it's just not worth it. And I think after reading all of these particular stories, we realized that you know it's not worth making a quick buck, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, as we know in life, it's not always about just the money. So is the travel blogging world also open to a lot of side perks? For instance, things like free yeah. hotel rooms, apparently free so, sort of stuff, but but Apparently you, so. Apparently um, <laughs> so. Apparently so. Again, as with anything, nothing is really easy if it's free. And, you know, there are a lot of people who are getting free stays, but they do work very hard to get them. And I don't mean very hard in terms of, um, you know, their Instagram, etc. you know. Maybe they're emailing 30, 40 hotels and one might say yes. And, you know, nobody got time mm. for that, Mark, honestly. Like, I just, you know, I'd rather just enjoy what we're yeah. doing. I'd rather work on our blog that brings us traffic than, you know, ask hotels for a free stay. Um, I, we're also not at a level mm. of success just yet. Like the big travel bloggers like Nomadic Matt or the Broke Back or Broke Back, um, Broke Backpacker, et cetera, where, you know, tourism boards are approaching us. Mm. So we, we're not there yet. Um, yeah. But, you know, say we, we could do some outreach, but it's just not our focus. I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased you talked about it like it in that way, because you've, you've maintained this realistic approach to it. And also, You've shown and shared with us the the reality of the situation you're in at the moment, and it's not it's like most things in life. There's no overnight storming success to get yeah. to the top. You've got to work your way through it. And travel no, blogging's no not. different and than anything else. You also else. can't get discouraged, right? So we've had some great success, but we know in terms of our traffic, there are blogs that have been working for three years that don't have the traffic that we have, right? Sometimes you know it's a mix mm. of hard work and luck, and um, you know, like I say, you just, yeah. that's why I just, yeah. I said earlier in our conversation, it's got to be a side hustle if you can, right? Start it as a side hustle. See if it's something that works for you. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Now, you're a unique character because you've had the opportunity to travel as a corporate warrior as yeah. well as now going and doing your own thing. So have you changed as an individual <laughs> And as a couple since um, you've started doing this? I mean, I would say my dress sense has changed, not for the good. I mean, I, mean, <laughs> I used to just, you know, wear high heels and nice dresses every day. And now I've got like, you know, ankle bracelets and, you know, a dark tan and I'm wearing hippie trousers. And, oh, gosh, I'm you know, such a statistic, Mark. But... Uh, mm. Well, welcome, yeah, totally. welcome to the dark side. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's changed, and also what I'll accept, right? You know, the first hostel that we stayed in, and yes, we stayed mm. in the private rooms always. The first hostel, I didn't want to touch anything. Now we'll get there, and my husband's like, "Oh, this mm. is grubby," and I'll be like, "Well, it looks okay to me." So, <laughs> oh, they're dropping. The standards so are diminishing. <laughs> you should live on a boat next. That'll take you to another level altogether. What about the relationship? Does it does it test the relationship a bit more by being constantly on the move and not having that base I mean, camp? I mean, when you you're spending twenty four hours a day with anybody, right? This this can be challenging. It's mm. interesting though. Like there was another travel mm. couple that we 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 know that they actually take um, either twin beds or if they can afford it, separate rooms um, when they travel. Um, mm. There's also a few. <laughs> they're they actually in their the 90s? same age as us, so. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. Don't tell us their names. We would, then. We we would never do tell. that, right? No. You know, and I think also when you're going to embark on something like traveling full time with somebody else, you really have to know that person and love that person because we've got a very strong marriage, so we're very lucky. Um, you know, you really mm. will find out somebody's truth when you're with them 24 hours a day, particularly if you're staying in hostels like we have. It's a really important point because I'm sure people listening to the show today are thinking, well, 
you know, as one member of the couple here, I might be the one that wants yeah. to take off and become a travel blogger, but yeah. how's my partner going to be with that, right? And and is it something, yeah. it's very much like living on a boat, actually, I think in terms of there's not many women that are able to uh, withstand, you know, the rigors no. of being a salty dog every day. So, uh, and imagine the same goes for, for being on the road. Do you find enough me time um, while you're traveling? I would traveling? say yes. I mean, again, like my husband is so understanding. So, you know, I'm, I'm quite lucky that way. So... I'll go off and I'll blow our entire entire daily budget on getting my hair done, you know, because I need it, mm. right? Or, you know, he'll go down yeah. and have a swim while I read my book or something like that. You know, we know how to be apart and we also know how to be together. Um, but like I said, it would be great to have a bit more me time. Um, that said, I think that we, we manage quite well. And like I said, in the last six months, we've maybe had two major arguments. And even those, we resolve those within mm. 15 minutes. So I, I think we're doing okay. That, yeah. That's a pretty yeah. good batting average, I'd say. What, what do you like the most about um, traveling I think together? That, you know, with anything, you bring different skills to the table, right? Um, so, you know, I'm particularly good mm. at finding good accommodation. And um, uh, my other half, James, he is the world's best navigator. I mean, this man can find his way through the back streets of Venice. He can, you know, he's honestly got a built-in compass, I'm sure <laughs> about it. So I think that, you know, say mm. we, we bring different things to the table, but also we know how to be... The, each other's rock in difficult circumstances you know if he's stressed about something i'm quite, quite good about calming him down and vice versa right so i think that this is you know i don't know if we'd be able to do th i would be able to do this solo i need somebody who's able to be the foil to to what i'm doing have either of you surprised each other with the newfound skills that you've had? I mean, I think I've surprised travel? him that I'm able to stay in a hostel and wear an ankle bracelet and go on a dodgy overnight bus in <laughs> Vietnam and, oh, my gosh, use a, a squat toilet. I mean, don't even get me started, right? So I think, I think that's been quite surprising. So to all the males out there listening to the show, it is possible you, you can. can change your lady. You can do it. Yeah. So what are the two most important things you've got in your backpack? Oh, man, the two most important things. Oh, this is going to sound so lame, but we have this thing called a pack safe. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. It's a portable safe. No, what's that? Um, it's actually kind of, it's made mm. of kind of reinforced um, canvas and steel mesh. Um, and it folds flat. I'm not even an ambassador or promoter of these guys. I just love it so much. But um, it f folds flat into your bag. And um, essentially, like I say, it's a safe that you can kind of tie to anything in your hotel room. And because, you know, hotel safes are actually not truly safe. And if you're traveling like us, your passport is so mm. important, uh, particularly as a South African, because you can't get a replacement. So, yeah, I would say the pack safe, oh. which, uh, like I say, mm. very good for safety and security. Um, and the other one, which again is going to sound really lame, Mark, is <laughs> we have we have these functional Tiva sandals. You know, oh gosh, they're so ugly. Oh, yes. mm. But you know, mm. when you've got one mm. backpack, you don't have space for hiking shoes and sneakers and 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 right. So these things can help you. Yeah. You know, when we're chasing waterfalls or we're kayaking, but also when you're walking the streets and you can't walk in flip flops, right? So they're just so, so ugly, but so functional. So let's do the flip side of this question and ask you what are the creature comforts you're um, missing? Sunday the most? roast. Oh, man. Oh, yes. Man, to mm. have a Yorkshire pudding and some, oh, <laughs> some proper Sunday roast. We would really love a Sunday roast. Um, and the other thing is uh, our cat. Um, you know, our cat is with um, mm. with my in-laws. Mm. And, oh, man, we Skype every few days just to see the cat. So, yeah. Just to see the cat. Well, I've got some bad news for you. And the bad news is you're not going to find a Sunday that roast. That is in so Lumpur. untrue. We have found a restaurant that does a Sunday roast. Yes. Oh, have you? <laughs> we oh, have. Oh, really? And um, we're going okay. there next Sunday to watch the rugby and uh, have a Sunday roast. And it's the okay. number 13 restaurant in all of Kuala Lumpur. So I'm very happy. <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, my naivety came out on my uh, understanding of kale after being there. I don't know how many times, but I, I, I must say that I'll preface my, my comment and make my excuse no. to say I never actually went <laughs> looking for a Sunday roast in Kuala Lumpur before. But there we are. Um, what's the least favourite part of what you're doing um, at the moment? Probably transport. 
um, you know, particularly like places like mm. Vietnam where you travel all the way from Hanoi down to Ho Chi Minh. Gosh, that's a lot of shuttles and buses and uh, also not being in control mm. of the drivers, right? So, you know, sometimes we've had really hellish drivers where we felt, you know, maybe this feels a little bit more unsafe than we would like. So, yeah, I would say the transport mm. itself is just so unglamorous. And, you know, like I say, you're always you're on a five or six hour bus ride and they're stopping at these dodgy stores where, again, you have to use a squat toilet. I don't know why I'm speaking about toilets so much, but really it's challenging. So I would <laughs> I would say that. Yeah. Well, it is a little bit different than getting a chauffeur driven oh, taxi. I can't, on a can't even tell you or, the difference, Mark. I'm quite surprised they haven't organised DHL jump seats to <laughs> well, take you around the world. And, they uh, have already on helped me when flights. our backpacks were too full. You know, very naive. We set off with these very heavy backpacks and then realised we don't need half of the stuff that's in there. Uh, so they very kindly I walked mm. into a DHL service point in Chiang Mai and they took a huge box out and they put it with all the stuff that I don't need and sent it back for us. Oh, brilliant. Now, a question for you, but you can also answer on behalf of James. What's your oh, favorite snack food terrible, when you're traveling? sounds terrible, Snickers. <laughs> it's the only chocolate Snickers. you can find okay. everywhere, and it just never lets you down. I mean, mm. it's 420 calories, right? So it's pretty much a full meal. And if, you, if, you know, if you're not sure what the other food at the snack stall is like, you know that a Snickers is going to do you, you know, a good meal. Yeah, you've got to eat it quickly. All the time? <laughs> You can't buy more than one. You buy one Snickers, you get it done quickly, you buy yourself a Coke Light. I mean, like I say, that that's that's a full-on meal. I've got a whiteboard going in my studio here on the boat with um, that question because oh. I ask every guest what their favourite snack food is while they're travelling and chocolate and nuts are number oh. one and two you respectively know, I think on the list at the moment. everybody wants to say really healthy things, right? But honestly, for us, if I yeah. see a Snickers yeah. or if I if I see a Crunchy, I'll just, oh, I'll buy, buy 10 of those. I had uh, guests say pumpkin seeds yesterday. I'd never heard no. of people eating pumpkin <laughs> seeds as part of their snack food while they're traveling. But I, I think was he was just say, trying yeah. to be healthy. I and, could pretend uh, and I could say, oh, it's dried mango, which I do actually enjoy. But like I say, in a head-to-head -head between a Snickers and a piece of dried mango, that Snickers just honestly, it's a knockout. Now, I was having a chat to my puppy dog last night, and he was telling me on the research he's done on you, your first novel's underway. Uh, You're writing I'm a novel, eh? I'm writing a novel. I'm not doing as well as I would hope, right? But, um, yeah, essentially right. my dream is to write a novel. Actually, since I was a kid, my dream was to write a novel. So this is uh, affording me an opportunity to write it. Who knows if any publisher's going to buy it? But, yeah, that's the idea. Okay, brilliant. Travelscribes.com, where's it going to be in five years from now? Oh, goodness. Well, I mean, I would hope it would be like Nomadic Matt and all of the big uh, travel websites. But if I'm honest, I think, um, you know, the website will probably grow a little bit over the next uh, few years. But I'd love to diversify us and try a few other businesses and, and travel websites and, and travel businesses alongside it. So, you know, again, I said to you that we intended to have 10,000 visitors by the end of this year and we had 110 in, in one month. And so I just don't know, right? It's It feels mm. like the potential mm. is unlimited. And like I said, the more I travel, the more I have ideas on how we're going to improve. So does that open up your optimism when, when you've had such a huge surge in following? Do you think now the sky's oh, the limit? Oh, I mean, I think anybody that's willing to work hard and is, you know, smart about it, I do think the sky's the limit. Like I say, there's so much opportunity out there. Um, it, it doesn't have to be a travel blog. As I said, anybody, you know, even just traveling and, say, helping other businesses or providing English services and translation services or teaching English, I mean, there's just so much out there that you could do to be able to make a living it just feels endless how do you what do you say to those people listening who want to go down this path and um you know they might have even just started and they're having some of those doubts or down days where it doesn't go too well what, what do you say to them to help them push through that and, and I keep mean, going you really just have what to. do you what techniques do you use when it, you have a bad day oh things? goodness i don't know if we have any good techniques i wish we could say you know we did yoga or we meditated or something right but you know mainly mm. we probably just got mm. snickers and just got over it but, but <laughs> you know i think that um we actually had this period just after we launched our blog where we we're like what are we doing what a waste of time you know we should just travel 
the whole time and we should just enjoy ourselves and why are we spending time writing this blog I'm so glad that we got over that because look at the success that we're having and yeah. you know that it was a real possibility that we we're going to stop doing it so you just got to get over that hump no pain yep. no gain and looking back now um, reflections a great thing to have in life so what's the reflection upon leaving the corporate world to do what you're doing where you're at now oh it's it's really 50 50 right because i'm enjoying it so much and you know i say i love traveling we love writing um, uh, the new experiences that we're having. But on the other side, if you're in a great company like, like you and I were, uh, Mark, I mean, you, you do miss the people that you worked with. And I miss my family and community of people that I worked with. So, you know, I'm just as likely to go back into corporate as I am to continue working freelance. It, it really does depend. Mm. And like I say, I really also th always thought the grass was greener, but sometimes you'd really have a good thing going. Yep, and you don't realize it until you actually go and try something else absolutely. as well. Mm. Lee, listen, it's been absolutely fantastic having a chat to you today. I'd love to have you back on the show later on down the track when you've you know done some more <laughs> yeah. of your traveling, but also Taken over the world, some of Mark. these other decisions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, why why not? But it's been fascinating to listen to you. You've, you've provided a lot of great advice to people out there who might be thinking about leaving that job whether it be corporate or not it doesn't matter but they might be leaving that job to go and chase a, a life of travel and you've provided some really great insights so i thank you very much and i'm going to let you go back to kl now and get ready for your sunday race oh, next fantastic. weekend fantastic thank you so much for having me i really appreciate it we'll speak again soon Ciao then. there we are that was lee scrivener talking to us from kuala lumpur today in malaysia and she and her husband james are on a fantastic whirlwind trip around the world and detailing all that so that many of us out here can read about their wonderful journeys and live vicariously through a travel vlogger. So I hope you got some good ideas and tips out there if you're into travel blogging or maybe you're just thinking about starting your own travel blog. Lee shared a lot of great stuff in that episode. If you're looking for other episodes from the Global Travel Channel podcast show, just head on over to our website at www.globaltravelchannel.com. It's as easy as that and there you'll find all of our previous episodes. You can download them from Apple iTunes, from Google Play, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spotify, and a host of other locations that are all listed on our website. If you like our content, why not tell a friend about it or share it with your family? We want to get as many listeners as we can around the world to the podcast show. Okay, that's it for this episode. My name is Mark Philpot, and until we meet again, I wish you all bon voyage.